uh, via telephone. He is the former Judiciary Chairman of the House. He's now a candidate for Governor Moore Capito. Moore, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. I was just thinking you got to get a title for yourself. You know, you get such talent in the studio. You I got do. Hall of Famers, mm-hmm. best-selling authors. We got a between, you know, between Matt and John, we'll come up with a uh, we'll come up with a name for you to call you before we introduce. You. Oh, he has a we, name. We, we just those. don't do it on the air. <laughs> oh, it's just, not, it's just not appropriate for radio, huh? I used to uh, call myself the bus driver uh, long ago when I started doing doing talk, and that I would just kind of go along at certain stops along the show, pick people up, and then mm-hmm. take them to a certain p- place, and then let them off, and then bring the next person on. So that was just kind of me, the bus driver. It's not a great nickname, but this is what I call myself. I mean, you know what? Yeah. You know, he is a Pittsburgh a Steeler fan, so just the bus. The bus, could, Jerome could, could Bettis, work, right? Know. Hall of Famer. <laughs> now we're see. Now we're getting there. I know you guys want to talk about a bunch of other things, but I think we're getting there. Yeah. Where Where are you? Speaking of getting there, where are you this morning? We're going to be in Southern West Virginia in Beckley this morning. Uh, sorry to miss you guys. Always like to be in studio with you guys when we're over in the Panhandle, which we were last uh, last week. Uh, but uh, glad to be joining you this morning. Yeah, great to have you, man. Uh, when is the next time you'll be in the Panhandle? Well, we've been spending a lot of time uh, over there, so uh, I suspect it'll probably be within the next week, I'd say, for sure. You'll be getting a call from me. Very good. Hey, uh, last Friday, I want to clarify something. Chris Miller was on the program in the 8 o'clock segment and made the claim uh, that uh, he would you know, love the debate, but he wasn't sure that uh, at least two other people in the field of four uh, for governor, we're interested in debating any longer. And in fairness to you, you have accepted our invitation to our candidate forum April the 16th. Uh, so far, we have three of the four candidates have accepted and agreed to appear to do that. That would be you and, uh, and, well, I should basically say Patrick Morrissey right now is the only camp we haven't heard back from yet. Uh, it doesn't mean he won't, just that to this point he hasn't. So, uh, anyway, any implication that you were afraid to debate uh, amongst the four candidates, uh, anybody who took that as uh, that implication, uh, unfortunately, it took that the wrong way. So apologies to you if you were offended by that in any way. No, we're, we're, we welcome the debate. I tell you, that's a great opportunity for me to get out there and, and uh, you know, talk about our vision for West Virginia. I'm ready to debate uh, any time. As you said, I'm ready to come. Uh, and be with you all and uh, talk about uh, policy and, and solutions to move West Virginia forward. Um, and I welcome every single opportunity to do that. I think it's great. Well, more, let's talk about a couple of areas of the state, though uh, the state has made great strides in many ways. And it would be hard to deny that, uh, except for Mike Pushkin. It would be very hard for, the, for anyone to <laughs> deny that. that. That's an inside joke since we had Mike on the show uh, last week. Uh, but there are some areas that do need a serious improvement. Uh, one of those is education. Another one of those is how we deal with the foster care situation in West Virginia. Let's start first with education. Uh, let's say there's a governor more capito on day one. What's the first thing that you're going to do to improve education in West Virginia? Well, I think what we're looking at in West Virginia, as I often say, is you know the biggest moral and economic uh, issue facing West Virginia right now is the education of our children, our grandchildren. But our education system is broken. I know that there's some discussion going on in the legislature right now to uh, provide for supplemental pay for certain teachers to ensure that we're filling those critical roles. One thing that I really believe that we have to do in day one, we absolutely will do is focus on our vocational schools in West Virginia. I had the opportunity last week uh, when I was in Martinsburg to Uh, visit with Blue Ridge uh, up there. And I tell you what's going on. Of course, that's one of our CTCs, I understand. Uh, But when you look at the training uh, that's going on at uh, at that institution, it's incredible. And the partnerships that's going on with Procter & Gamble and other employers in the area to make sure that we have the workforce to fill the roles uh, that are needed for a next generation of workforce that's absolutely something that we need to do. So we started, uh, I've been visiting with our vocational schools that take our high school students in all over the state. And what we're noticing is, Rob, there are lines to get in. I mean, it's almost like waiting lists. You know, back in the day, it was trying to get into, you know, college, you get on a wait list, this, that, and the other. Now it's for vocational schools because I think our kids are starting to realize that is where the good paying jobs are, where you can create a career grow a family and prosper in West Virginia. When you look across the country, 
there's a real shortage in skilled uh, workforce. And that is something in West Virginia that we can absolutely own. It's not difficult to do. We're doing it right now, but we have to expand those opportunities. So day one, we'll absolutely do that. Well, and let, let me applaud you for that because my brother and I are, are, are students that went through the vocational program here at James Rumsey. Uh, I went through drafting and actually worked in that field for about a year and a half after high school before taking a different route. My brother worked in machine trades and to this day is still in machine trades. And from that education through James Rumsey has gone on to uh, get into supervisory roles and has done very well for himself and his family. And like you're talking about, I, I can see vocational training being so crucial and important to a lot of students who really get lost in the mix of this college emphasis that seems to be in a lot of, of high schools. No question about it. And I think when what I said, as governor, we will have a West Virginia Ready program where every single high school student in West Virginia will be able to either pass a military uh, entrance exam, a college admissions exam, or have a vocational work skill. I mean, when we think about getting a job, somebody once said in this very profound, simple advice, have a vocation that you can do. You know, at the end of the day, you can try uh, whatever you want, the American dream, right? You can grow your business and be what you want to be in America. But at the end of the day, always have something that you've been trained to do that you can fall back on. And especially uh, with regard to vocational training, we're training all of our kids these wonderful skills that they will have for a lifetime. And what, what can they do with them? How can we combine other educational components to ensure that our kids are flourishing with those opportunities? I think we need to make sure that we're teaching all of our kids financial management. We have to do it at home around the kitchen table. I got two kids. We do it all the time. I mean, with this inflation, it's a little more difficult right now, but financial management is one. And one thing that I've been passionate about my entire time is entrepreneurship and innovation. Think about when we take somebody who's skilled in a trade and a professional and we teach them the, you know, the, 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 the value of you know, financial planning and growing your own books and learning how to manage that. And then adding that entrepreneurial component, we're going to have kids that not only have the skills and the responsibility and the know-how, but they're going to have that entrepreneurial spirit that's going to allow them to grow their own business right here in West Virginia. Yeah, but <clears throat> more than John Gilstrap, good morning. But everybody, hey, no matter what track one takes out of high school, whether it be um, the uh, vocational schools, I, I applaud everything that you just said, but every, they still need to be able to read in third grade. And they, they still need to be able to do arithmetic and math, maybe not calculus if you're going to, I don't know, it depends on where they're going to go. The big problem we have in West Virginia, as I see it, starts at, at kindergarten up through you know, learning the basics. How do, what do you plan to do to address that side where it's clearly you're not going to have vocational schools for eight-year-olds? Well, not at this point, John, but uh, we'll, we'll see how, how that It depends on if the child think, labor bill passes. No, <laughs> no that's, a, that's, a, that's a really great question. And, you know, I have to get it done conservative in this race. And one of the reasons that I say that is we took that head on last year with the Third Grade Success Act. We understand the importance of ensuring that our children are on metric and we're measuring those sort of benchmark uh, ideas, the one that you mentioned, which is critical, which is reading. So in the Third Grade Success Act, over the next several years, we're going to make sure that every first, second, and third grade classroom has supplemental teachers in there to ensure that we're focusing on our children so that by that third grade year, my daughter's in third grade right now. I'm watching it for the first time. It's amazing. She's reading to learn. We know that kids uh, are learning to read up until that third grade mark, but at that third grade mark, we know by the percentages and by the numbers, the chances for success, if kids are reading by the third grade, are exponential. So we've put an emphasis and a focus on that. We absolutely need to double down on it, but we have to make sure that we have the, you know, that we have those supplemental resources to go into the classroom to do it. But we still have the, the issue. To me, there's there's this. Um sort of a knot of, of issues that all 
come down to the education system and it ties to the foster care issues we have it ties to the drug addiction issues that we have and it comes to the the poverty that we have in in large portions of the state is doesn't all of that have to be conquered in order for everything else to work one of the biggest strengths that we have john in west virginia is in our communities we have amazing support systems within our communities but we haven't activated them the cps issue is an incredibly serious issue and we know that caseworkers are stretched very thin right now what the data tells us is that cps workers are more and more becoming the first call we need to set up a system where cps workers are actually the last call we need to make sure that our families are getting the help that they need early on with preventative services so that we have a greater, a greater web uh, of support systems for our families um, so that we can create a stronger community. But you're absolutely right. It is, they're all interconnected. And with the drug epidemic, I've said it very clearly that anybody that is pushing fentanyl on our streets or any human traffickers in the state of West Virginia will go, will go away for life. Because for far too long, we've been giving criminals and bad guys the benefit of the doubt. At the end of the day, this is cyclical. And these people are coming back out onto our streets and falling into the same thing. And they're bringing more and more victims uh, along. And here's the thing. The victims are our children. Um, and we can't let that happen anymore. So we have to take the supply off the street, create the safest communities in the country. And when we have safe and strong communities, I believe that's going to lift our education system because there's going to be more involvement. But how do you do that? What's the string to pull where we have, where there are unsafe communities? How do we make them safe again? Are we talking about hiring more police officers? Are we talking about restructuring the, the local government? How does that actually work? One of the big points, I've traveled 70,000 miles across the state of West Virginia just showing up and listening. And a lot of those uh, sort of roundtables that we had have, have been with law enforcement. Uh, and one thing has become abundantly clear. We have to provide law enforcement the tools and the training that they need to be able to combat the issues that you talk about. So whether that's attacking the drugs on the street, dealing with our children and the calls that they get to go to homes, um, training is a critical, critical component. I believe that we need to invest in our law enforcement. I can't tell you how many communities I've been to all across the state of West Virginia where I'm hearing, well, we have 10 deputy sheriffs, but we probably should have 16. Well, we have, you know, eight police officers, but we should probably have 10. We need to make sure that we're taking a regional approach. We're listening to our local governments about the law enforcement that they need and the supplemental resources that they need. And the state needs to collaborate and communicate to make that happen. Is some of that <clears throat> lack of, of, of positions filled and the need for more officers in law enforcement across our state related to pay in those situations, or is it simply a matter of having a hard time in our state finding those who really want to look at that as a career path? Well, I think there's multiple things that we can do. Certainly, um, you know, compensation uh, is one of them, but unfortunately, in society today, you, you look at what's going on in all of these liberal cities across the country. We don't back our blue anymore. I mean, in West Virginia, I remember when I walked around as a kid, if I was you know, near a police officer, I was standing straight up, paying attention. I mean, those are the people that we look up to. And we've sort of changed that dynamic where that, that dynamic has changed in society where we no longer are looking up to our law enforcement officers. So we need to change that dialogue. And that's societal. I mean, that's about attitude. And as governor, we're going to always put our police officers first and say, this is our line of defense. These are the people that are keeping our communities safe. And so it's about valuing that career. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that have said, you know, I don't really want to get into law enforcement because I feel like people are teaming up against me or I'm going to, it's too easy to make a mistake. I mean, look, at the end of the day, we need to have good uh, we, we need to have good training for our law enforcement officers because we'll get better people. And I think once we build that reputation back in West Virginia, get the compensation and the training that we need, I also think that we can retool our civil service 
uh, laws in West Virginia. I think they're a little outdated. We have a lot of people, especially in the panhandle, uh, that have worked in other states, are trained as good law enforcement officers, and we should be able to take advantage and leverage their willingness to want to come work on our police forces and do good in our communities and not let some archaic law that we passed, you know, 40 years ago because of civil service keep them from doing that. More Capitos, our guest. He is the former House Judiciary Chairman, candidate for governor in West Virginia. And uh, let's talk about foster care children more. I know we split uh, Department of Health and Human Services into three uh, different and uh, somewhat unique categories, each with their own division head now and independent from each other, as I understand it. So it's fair to give them a chance to work. However, it's not necessarily fair to those kids right now who are in foster care or waiting to be in foster care. What's your plan as governor to take care of these children who are often forgotten about? Well, one of the biggest problems, Rob, that we discovered uh, in, in in, in sort of looking into this breakup of, of that department was that there was really no communication. And it seems sort of counterintuitive to break a department up when it's not communicating and, and think it's going to communicate better. But I think that it will because you have emphasis on different sort of tranches of expertise. Um, but at the end of the day, as a father of two kids, again, this is our future. So we have to ensure that our foster parents are getting the support that they need. We had looked at several measures Uh, last year when I was uh, uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee to improve opportunities for grandparents, to encourage grandparents to get involved with their grandchildren. Uh, We know that some of the red tape that stands in the way of our foster parents uh, is sort of unbearable. And at the end of the day, sometimes it causes these foster parents to just hoist the white flag and say, it's too much. I don't want to do it. We need to encourage people to get involved because as you said, we have kids that are waiting to be placed right now. And we have loving parents and foster parents that want to take these kids in. So let's make it happen. And I think you make that happen by listening to the foster parents, listening to the obstacles that are in the way and listening to the professionals that are out there, the counselors and the mental health professionals to find the best best path forward. Can you give can you give an example of what these obstacles are? Well, for instance, sometimes, you know, we'll have, you know, there'll be folks that are, you know, going into a home and they're doing a review of, of the home and something was uh you know, to, to, to review how suitable, you know, what I, the, the house is for, for a child. Uh, we're finding that there's large time delays in that. So we know that the longer that it takes for folks to get out and do a review of placement homes um, is causing a delay and it causes a backlog. So we need to make sure that those time frames are very much tightened. Uh, I think that's one thing we can absolutely do. Process. I- Okay, here's a very elementary question to all of this. It just now occurred to me. It should have occurred to me a long time ago. Where do these? Where are these kids? They've been taken from their families. They're not yet placed in foster homes. Where are they? Where are the kids that, sorry, repeat the question you broke out? The, the kids that have already been taken from their parents. Their parents have been taken from their kids is probably a better way to put that. Well, and they're in the custody of the state, and that's part of the problem. We don't have, we're, we're struggling to find places for them. And that, and, but where and are they sleeping? I mean, are they in... Uh, are they in? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, that John, that, that depends. I mean, it depends on what area they're in. Sometimes they're in the state custody. Sometimes they're in, you know, different homes. But again, this is this is this is you're you're highlighting the issue of why we've got to we've got to speed the process along. We've got to give um, we've got to give timelines. We have to hold people accountable, and we have to make sure that you know that this continues to flow at a fast pace because children are suffering because of it. And you, you nailed it right on the head. The unpredictability has got to be the biggest concern of it. Uh, and some of those kids are in hotels, mm-hmm. motels, That's hotels, right. and stuff. So I think some of them have been taken at Fairmont uh, State University uh, in the dorms. As, as I remember, there was a cooperative agreement that was signed. Uh, more, let's talk about locality pay in parts of the state where the border is an issue and better paying jobs are just a bridge away. The Eastern Panhandle is clearly an example of that. Uh, here, where houses cost in in relative comparison to some counties around the state five, six, seven times more 
than they might cost in other counties in, in West Virginia. Is there a more capital plan for locality pay? You know, I think we always have to look at what are the priorities of government, safety and education. How do we get the proper police officers, EMS, uh, and fire folks to want to, to work? One of those pieces is compensation. We obviously have to uh, take that into consideration when we're looking at growing uh, our fire and EMS and, and, and law enforcement agencies. Um, I, we've heard a lot about locality pay. It's, it's a conversation that you know we've had on the floor and will continue to have. Um, we have to think about it on education. I, I was talking to an educator in Jefferson County just last week where I believe that the pay was, what is it, $20,000 more in Virginia and maybe 10 in Maryland. Um, so how, are the, how do we become more competitive? Uh, you know, it's not just limited to the Eastern Panhandle. I can tell you that we have a lot of border counties in West Virginia, and all of them are getting pulled. So we need to make sure at the end of the day that we're properly compensating our educators, our law enforcement officers, our fire, and our EMS um, so that we can keep them here. It, it, it's an across-the-board issue. Moore, you were one of the architects and supporters of flatline budgeting, and we've we've got a lot of surpluses in, in the bank right now as governor. In your first term, are you going to approach the legislature for more money? Because theoretically, we just spent a lot of it during this conversation. Well, I don't I, I don't really recall where we've spent a lot of it. I think, again, I, I think that the most important things that government can do is focus on getting the resources. Resources doesn't always mean compensation. It means getting people into the areas that they need to be in, safety, education. How do we encourage people to, to get into uh, those roles? But we also have to grow the pie with our economic. I mean, you know, John, John at the end of the day, we, we in West Virginia, we're growing, especially in the Eastern Panhandle, it's growing. You got more people going to work every single day. You got more people getting involved in vocational schools. You got more people getting involved in our CTCs. Those are going to grow the jobs and the tax base. We're going to have more people working. That creates more opportunities. I've been a proponent of flatline budgets, absolutely. And what have we seen as a result of that? When I came into the legislature, we were $500 million in the hole. And just last year, we had a $2 billion surplus. This year, we're running ahead after passing the largest tax cut, which I was proud to support and lead in the history of the state. And we're seeing growth in West Virginia. That's what we have to continue to focus on, economic policies that are going to grow the pie. When we grow the pie, keep the flatline budgets. It creates more opportunities for support in these areas. Few things are more important than creating good, well-paying jobs with benefits uh, anywhere. It, it, it is the cure to many problems in many communities. Uh, as the, uh, you know, if you've got a job and it's a good one and you can feed your family and you can take care of your kids, good things tend to flow from that uh, more, and that's the key to it. What's the more capital economic plan in West Virginia? I've always been a proponent of entrepreneurship and innovation. Look at what's going on, especially in the Eastern Panhandle. We have entrepreneurs and innovators that are coming and flocking to that area. And why are they flocking there? Because we have a lifestyle that fits what they want to grow their family. They got low density housing, um, a cost of living that is much better in comparison to other places in the region. We're providing educational choice for parents so they can choose the educational pathways for their children, which I was proud to support. We'll continue to expand that. I, all of these um, uh, synergistic things that are going on in West Virginia create opportunities. But at the very base of it all is our, our, our focus and our emphasis on our entrepreneurship and our small businesses, allowing us to provide more opportunities for people to grow their businesses to reinvest more of their money into their companies, to cut red tape. I've already cut a thousand pieces. We'll cut a thousand more um, because we know that at the end of the day, we want people focusing on the work that they're passionate about, not doing paperwork all day to try to make the government happy. So let's get the government out of the way and let them do their jobs. More final minute is yours. Anything else you'd like to say? Rob, it's always good to be with you. It's great to be in the Eastern Panhandle. We have an incredible opportunity in a very, very small window 
uh, in West Virginia for explosive growth. We're seeing it in the Eastern Panhandle. We're seeing it in other parts of the state. We're going to focus on running this campaign like the election is tomorrow, just as we have for the past 12 months. And the emphasis of that, and it's exactly how I'll be as governor, in the communities, listening to people. Because at the end of the day, I think that our people have the solutions. And as governor, I'll work to put those solutions and ideas into good public policy measures. You can learn more about us at morecapito.com. I'm the Get It Done conservative, and we'll continue to get it done for West Virginia. More, thank you for your time. Always appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rob. Good to be with you all. See you, Matt. John. Take care. Take care.